Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. And uh, I would like to, um, first of all, speak in favour of um, new clauses 2 and new clause 58, which have been tabled by our front bench. And, and to add uh, just a, a couple of small points on that. Um, one is the, the idea that we should be giving uh, the government the benefit of the doubt on the, these issues when we've seen uh, so, so many of the uh, statements and indeed acts of uh, the opposing benches from uh, the repeal of the uh, Trade Union Act through to many, many other attempts to undermine employment rights is reason number one why we need to anchor this, uh, um, the, the rights of our um, workforce uh, through this bill. But it's also to say that uh, as part of the Brexit Select Committee, uh, we had a meeting with Mr Barnier in Brussels uh, last week. And one of the points he made very clearly is that as we move towards the future relationship, uh, the so-called deep and comprehensive uh, free trade agreement, um, that, of course, will need to be uh, ratified by all of, of the uh, parliaments of the member states plus a number of regional parliaments, and they will not accept anything that he described as social dumping. They will not accept undercutting. They will not accept uh, unfair regulatory practice. So if the government is serious about getting a deep and com comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU, they're going to have to recognise that regulatory equivalence will have to be a critical part of that. So this isn't only about securing rights in this country, it is also about the economic interests of the country if we're serious about having that uh, future relationship. I, I will give way briefly. Entirely endorse what he said about a free trade agreement with the European Union requiring regulatory equivalence. But actually, this isn't some uniquely uh, European thing or malicious Brussels proposal. Modern trade agreements in the globalised economy all depend more than anything else on mutual recognition or regulatory convergence in these sectors where free trade is going to be allowed. The Honourable Learned Gentleman, as always, is, is absolutely correct on this. And what we need to recognise is that there's an umbilical cord going from these regulatory playing fields through to these uh, trade agreements uh, because of uh, the nature of unfair competition, unfair practice, uh, and none of the member states of the European Union will accept them. And what was particularly interesting about what Mr Barnier said was, as we move into the comprehensive uh, trade deal uh, discussions, they will be on the basis of Article 218 of the treaty, which requires ratification by 27 member state parliaments and eight regional parliaments. And so uh, the, the, the level of uh, scrutiny uh, will be even greater in terms of the future relationship than it will be in terms of the transitional arrangement, because of course we know that the transitional arrangement will be a carbon copy of the status quo, including European Court of Justice jurisdiction. And uh, I, I think that's been accepted by the uh, the bench is opposite, although there seems to be some attempt to wriggle out of some aspects of that. But the, the fact of the matter is the transition deal will be a carbon copy of the status quo. In terms of uh, uh, New Clause 22, I, I do rise to support that wholeheartedly. And I, I thought that my honourable friend, uh, the uh, member for Lewis East, made an absolutely outstanding speech in terms of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, outlining the, the virtues of uh, the European economic area. Um, what I would like to do is build on that by saying to the government that uh, we, let, let's accept then that the position is that we have to leave the single market and the customs union. My argument is in fact that uh, by going into the European economic area and EFTA, uh, th those are not in fact the single market and the customs union. It is possible uh, to go into those two <coughs> bodies and to deliver on the government's uh, uh, wish to leave the single market and the customs union. The European economic area does not include the common agricultural policy or the common fisheries policy. Uh, and uh, it also gives the opportunity to exclude free movement of labour. Articles 112 and 113 of the European economic area agreement provide the opportunity to pull the emergency brake uh, on the basis of uh, economic and societal uh, issues, uh, and uh, there is a legal precedent whereby uh, one of the uh, EEA countries has in fact set industry by industry quotas uh, on the free movement of labour. So uh, my, the case I would make to the government is that the EEAF model actually enables them 
to uh, square the circle between uh, not uh, wrecking the British economy by cutting off all of our links with 500 million consumers uh, on our doorstep, whilst also uh, being able to deliver on many of the very legitimate concerns that were expressed during the referendum campaign on the free movement of labour. What I would also uh, add is that uh, EFTA, of course, is not a customs union. It is a free trade area, uh, and it is possible uh, on that basis to do bilateral trade deals uh, with other countries, which of course is not possible through full membership of the customs union. Uh, an example I would give is the fact that uh, uh, Iceland, which is one of the uh, EFTA members, has a bilateral free trade uh, agreement with China. Uh, so there's nothing to stop EFTA countries from striking those deals. Um, the, the, uh, the other uh, argument that's sometimes used is around uh, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Well, of course, honourable members will know that uh, the uh, EEA and EFTA are under the jurisdiction of the EFTA Arbitration Court. Uh, if the UK were to join that court, it would give that court a considerable degree of extra clout, uh, and uh, that, I think, would help to rebalance the relationship with the ECJ. The EFTA Arbitration Court does, of course, take uh, much of its uh, steer and guidelines from the ECJ, but it is not slavishly uh, attached to it. And if the UK were to be in that court, uh, it would provide a, sig a significant degree of autonomy and... Uh, 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 I, I would just like to... I know, no, I heard what you said... I heard what the honourable gentleman said, and he knows he knows per, he knows perfectly well. I just well, careful. I just be grateful for him to explain how often and in what circumstances the court that he's just described has departed from EU jurisdiction or from decision making on the precedence of the ECJ. I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. This is a clear case of a before and after conversation. The current uh, court would be substantially altered were the United Kingdom uh, to have judges uh, in that court, and it would be um, a category shift in terms of uh, the role of that court. Uh, this is, of course, something that would require negotiation, but what, what I am offering uh, is an opportunity to square the circle, so many of the uh, contrasts and conflicts that we have <coughs> and, and competing agendas uh, that we need to deliver through uh, uh, you know, delivering a Brexit that works for the whole country and which uh, delivers on the fact that, not, that, that there were millions of people that voted in the referendum that are not ideologues or zealots on one side or the other. They want this parliament to get on with the job. They want this parliament to deliver a Brexit that works for the whole country and indeed helps to reunite our country. And it's in that spirit that I believe that new clause 22 is so important and offers uh, so much. There's many, uh, much conversation about models, the, the Canada model. Well, Canada, the Canada model doesn't include services. The, uh, the Ukraine model, very new and untested. The EEA is a well-established and after well-established, well-understood model. It would give our business community and our economy the, the certainty that it so desperately needs. I won't give way. There are many, many people who want to speak, so I'm afraid I'll have to make progress. Um, I, I, I would like to, to close my remarks, uh, Mr Hansen, by saying that uh, we are in a hiatus and it's deeply damaging to the British economy. We're drifting uh, and rudderless, uh, we're floating in a mist of ambiguity and indecision on the part of the government because they are refusing to set out the roadmap to our future relationship. We know that there isn't time to do that bespoke deal. We know it needs to be a well-established, well-understood deal uh, off the shelf. We, we also know that it is necessary to trigger Article 127 of the EEA agreement in order to leave the EEA because we have signed up to that agreement as a single and sovereign contracting party. There is op legal opinion is very divided on this issue, therefore it becomes a political issue. It's time for this House to show some leadership, to have the debate about our future relationship with the single market, to take back control in this sovereign parliament, and I therefore commend New Clause 22 to the House. Very good.